Hello, everyone. Thank you to be here to follow this uh, keynote speaker number two session uh, with our invited speaker, Timo Hartmann. Uh, a short highlight of his career is that Professor Hartmann is uh, working at the University uh, Technic Technische Universität Berlin since 2016 as a professor of civil systems engineering in the Civil Engineering Institute. And he also is a head of department in this same institute. Before Berlin, he was professor at the University of Twente in Netherlands from 2008 to 2016. Um, work as a consultant and as a uh, well CEO in a spin off from the Center for Visualization and Simulation in Construction. Uh, he has a PhD from Stanford, in Stanford University in 2002. And during that time, he's acted as a consultant from a number of companies in San Francisco Bay Area. His master's degree is from Technische Universität Munich, uh, earned in 2004. And his diploma is from uh, uh, in civil engineering 2002. He has a number of uh, papers, awards, and curing funded research, as well as, as more than 100 papers published in uh, referred journals and conferences around the world. He is invited editor and reviewer for a number of journals. Uh, now is the editor in chief of Advances in Engineering Informatics journal, is very important for our area, and is also a very active person with a strong community participation. Here is, for your amusement, Professor Hartmann. Please, Timo, the floor is yours. Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you, Sergio. Um, yeah, welcome to the keynote. Um, yeah, sad enough, we can't we can't be here um, together physically, and um, yeah, I'm home in Berlin. You see, the sun's going down. Um, I hope you are everywhere in the world and, and will enjoy this talk. But obviously, it would have been much nicer to see all of you and to chat with you afterwards. I already said, you know, we could have gone to some samba club um, after the keynote. But okay, we have to um, work with what we have. And um, yeah, uh, Sergio, I don't know if my screen is not shared. Ah, here it comes, right? So, um, so I prepared a keynote today for you. Um, I titled it Digitizing Building Renovation Projects. And it's basically probably a summary of um, one of the strongest research lines that I was involved in in the last 10 years. And uh, it's something that also um, is very close to my heart. Um, I believe sustainability is um, the one major challenge that um, I'm always calling myself a civil engineer, but everybody who works in the built environment needs to tackle. And um, I guess already a couple of years ago, I said I really want to focus on, on things that, you know, um, relate to aspects of sustainability in terms of, um, of course, the three triple bottom, bottom line of um, <clears throat> ecological, financial, but also social. And um, renovation projects are um, in our Western societies, one of the keys in my opinion, to A, create social housing and, 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 and improve the housing conditions. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, um, to really make a ecological impact. And so I, I decided to present some of our research. Um, I called it digitizing, and digitizing is a very important word for me. Um, related to a lot of the things we do in advanced engineering informatics in the journal as well. And um, I kind of want to start with like, you know, these are two definitions from Gartner. Um, contrasting digitization with digitalization, right? And um, so digitization is the process of changing from analog to digital form. And so, um, and digitalization is the use of digital technologies to change a business model and provide new revenue and value producing opportunities. It's a process of moving to a digital business. And um, I call it digitization because I feel that at the current state of a lot of our research, 
um, we are still working a lot of, on digitizing the process of building renovation. Though I hope throughout the talk, I can provide like some glimpses of digitalization, which I'd say some of that, and I hope I can show that, is already done by um, a couple of um, innovative startups. Um, some of that is still in the research room, which is our um, responsibility, right? Um, but it's not yet ready for um, implementation in, in, in practice. But we work hard on that, and there's a lot of stuff to do. And so I hope you're going to enjoy um, the next, let's say, 40 minutes or so, where you're going to show like a lot of different things of this building renovation project, uh, process and how you can improve it. Um, either by digitizing or by digitalizing. Um, little disclaimer, so a lot of the things um, I'm going to show are from a um, large-scale European Union project. So I don't know if you are um, familiar with the Horizon 2020 program. The Horizon 2020 is the European Union research funding program. It's, I think, the biggest in the world. Um, and we were lucky to be involved in two large project, the P2 and Dua project, and the BIM project, and the BIM speed project, and, and both of these projects are really large consortial projects, so there's like, I think on P2 and Dua we are having 18 partners, and on BIM speed we are having 21 partners, partner organizations, so I think the last um, general assembly meeting in BIM speed that we had, we had 60 people online discussing, right, so they're rather large projects, so a lot of the things I'm going to show um, might come from a partner. I try to acknowledge along the way some of the things are our research. Not everything has been developed on the projects, but I just wanted to show. And please go to the website, familiarize yourself with these projects. I think um, the results that we created on them are really, really important and outstanding. So, um, yeah. And of course, you know, disclaimer, what I talk about is not necessarily the opinion of the European Union. Um, so let me start, and I don't want to go too much into this motivational stuff, um, rather provide you strong numbers. So we know that buildings are responsible in Europe for 40% of the energy consumption and 36% of the CO2 emissions, right? Um, yeah, we know also that um, building new buildings is not a problem, we can significantly reduce that number. Um, but building new buildings is not an option, in my opinion, because the old buildings have a lot of what we call embodied carbon. So if we demolish them and we build buildings new, we need to um, use a lot of resources that we don't have any longer. Right? Um, we always need to keep in back of our mind that the worldwide cement industry is responsible for 12% of the um, worldwide CO2 exhaust, steel industry for 9%. So just like demolishing and creating new things so we can save some energy here in Europe, um, it's not um, the way to go. So unfortunately, um, we do quite often demolish the buildings because it's really, really hard to renovate buildings. Um, so a little bit about the European building stock, 90% of the buildings were built before 1990 and 40% were built before we had the first energy regulation. So by now, if you build a new building, you have to follow energy regulations, you have to show that your building is energy efficient, the energy certificates and all this stuff. But by large, most of the buildings we have in, in Europe are really built before that. So they're not energy efficient, right? Um, another interesting fact is that 75% of the European building stock is residential. So yes, we can do, we, and we do some work in, in, in renovation of offices and tertiary buildings and so forth, but um, the big gain is really if we find better ways to really renovate residential buildings. And if you look around Europe, the shape of the building stock um, varies quite, but um, in a lot of countries, it's in a very, very bad shape. Um, so how do we do renovating? So uh, the renovation rate across Europe is about 2%. So every year we renovate about 2% of the building stock. So if we are done with the renovation, it's 50 years or something, right? So that, that's much too slow. Um, then if we renovate today, right? And looking at 
what the effect after renovation is, right, on the energy use, on the building performance, energy use here, then we know that 85% of the renovations, we only reach 0 to 30% energy reduction. Um, sounds good, right? Good number. But if you look at that, we actually achieve 10% that can reduce 30 to 60%, and 5%, even 60 to 90. And then, you know, we have even a, a small number of like maybe lighthouse projects in the renovation that reach energy neutrality. I think we could do much better, right, in that sense. And so that's a little bit the introduction about, you know, renovation of buildings in Europe. I don't know how it's in your country. Um, but I think everywhere I go, the problems kind of are the same. Um, and, you know, and if not, then they probably will be because, you know, in, in 10 to 15 years, you probably will need to think of how to renovate your building stock. Um, so if we look at the renovation project, and this is actually some a, a, a proposed renovation model that we came up with on the P2 and Duo project. And it's not a very nice figure. Um, it has too much detail for this presentation. But we actually say that building renovation should be um, cyclic. So you start with mapping. I'm going to say a little bit about mapping. But mapping should be a very quick, um, cheap thing to look at what are, is there potential for renovation. After you decided that, you move to modeling. And modeling is, should be really about you know, getting all the detail, the design and engineering of your renovation options so you can move to construction. Then phase three is making. And so that's the construction phase where we do that. And then we very, will believe very much in phase four monitoring that after you renovate it, you certainly should start monitoring um, how the building is performing. And because if you monitor, and I'm going to talk a lot about this later, um, you can support the mapping and the modeling phase again significantly. All right. And so actually, when we when we look at our projects, and we have we have a lot of demonstration projects where we really renovate and support renovation work with um, digital technologies across Europe. I think we are working on like 20 buildings or something at the moment across these two projects, um, you see that we actually start with monitoring, right? Um, but more towards that. But this is a simple process that we kind of use. We can hang, al hang all along. It helps us to, to understand where which technology can play a role. Um, it also helps us, you know, to, to just manage and, and plan renovation projects. Um, so, what we have by now, and this is something from BIM Street, like um, for each of these, and then we, we mapped it also with other stages. So you see one, two, three, four, five stages, and then other stages. So these are other process models um, that, that other people suggested in the end. But this is just a small screenshot of a much bigger, what we call our use case tree. So across these projects, we are in this constant um, discussion with each other where are actually things where we can use technology in this case we call it bim but you know where we can use some bim tele technology some digitization where we maybe can move to digitalization where the computer helps us already to do things significantly different right and so this is just a, a small screenshot and i think we have more than 200 use cases by now um i can't introduce them all um we are working at the moment um, on an online database with a browser possibility where you can really look at the use cases in which phase you are. Um, we also have what we call our use case maturity assessment model where you answer some questions about your BIM maturity, you answer some questions about you know the specifics of your project, and then you know hopefully we can suggest some use cases that you can actually do with your maturity and that would be helpful for your specific project. So that's just something to show you the big range of you know possibilities. Um, I'm gonna focus on a couple of these um, in this presentation that I thought were most interesting. Um, let's start with the mapping phase. So as I said, mapping should be really you know considered as a very quick way to assess a building. In this phase, 
we don't want to spend a lot of money. We also don't want to spend a lot of time. Um, because if we do that, um, you know, there's this, this, this notion of sunk costs, right? So it gets more difficult and more difficult to stop. But some buildings might not even make sense to renovate, right? Some, some we need to demolish because, you know, we, there's little to gain through to a renovation, right? And so this is really about really quickly assessing the building. And there's not a lot of digitization in this phase, right? I mean, okay, we have all drawings. We can digitalize these all drawings, scan them in, put them on things. And then, um, you know, we have some commercial software available already. This is an example from, from a Dutch company, right? It's called manual inspection software where you get guided through the inspection through with, you can go with an iPad, right? And quickly inspect buildings and so forth. But it's still very low tech, right? So this is really digitization in its, in its former sense. So we create a platform. Um, people were inspecting the buildings before with a piece of paper, maybe with a camera, took pictures, right? Had them somewhere. And this tool really can combine these inspections. You can keep notes. You have like a work breakdown structure of different elements and so forth that you can find things again, right? Um, and so just, you know, to start off, I don't want to stay along in this mapping because what really drives me is the modeling phase. And so I'm going to, um, talk a lot about the modeling phase um, in the rest of the talk. Um, and at the end, a little bit about the making phase, because the making phase is something very interesting. Um, also, where, you know, I think a lot of you who work in the BIM area um, and, and this le level of detail thinking on renovation projects is actually an interesting thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so what's the goal of modeling? Modeling is really, the goal is to get a detailed design and engineering of the most effective, most optimal renovation option, right? And um, this is some dashboards designed by uh, a Berlin startup that, you know, wants to help you with understanding, you know, the, the, the building performance on, of, of different options, right? And you know, we always have to think it's a it's a multi criteria decision making process, right? So there's something like investment costs and operational costs. So you need to actually calculate these different because investment costs you need to run to a bank and ask the bank for it, right? And then operational costs you save over time, right? So and then like very important, which is often forgotten. We always say, yeah, we want to be as energy efficient as possible. And I would say, yeah, that, that's easy. Then you just um, disconnect the building from the grid. It's not very nice to live in there, but you can't use any energy any longer, right? Um, so that's not the goal. So the goal need to be to at least maintain, but you know we have the possibility to also improve the comfort of the people who live there, while at the same time save energy, right? So, so things like thermal comfort, lighting comfort, air quality, um, uh, on BIM speed, we also look at acoustic comfort, right? This is very important. When you live in an old building that's at the street and you move to a new building that, or to a newly renovated building that has a triple glazed window, that's like significantly increasing your comfort, but also the energy behavior of the building, right? So these two need to be always going hand in hand, right? Um, and so how do you get there to really understand what is the best renovation option? And I, I have like three simple steps here, right? So the first step is really, we need to get to a digital twin of the existing building, right? And I, I have digital twin here in brackets, and that's a very important concept for me. It needs to be simulation based. Um, if we have the digital twin, right? We need to be able to really evaluate different renovation options. And there are many, right? There are zillions of different renovation options. And they're kind of specific for renovation because it's very product centric. I'll talk about this later, right? Quickly. And then we want to compare and balance these options in a multi criteria way to find the best one. So that's basically the process. We can do that, I mean, digital twin, you know, or simulation based, but, you know, we can also calculate something on a piece of paper or school about energy use and, you know, whatever. So we can do this without computer support, but that's very crude, right? So let's use the computer for it to support this, right? And um, 
said already, the first step is the digital twin. And for, for us, the digital twin is not just the 3D model, you know. Or oftentimes now people say it's a 3D model that describes the current or where you get information about the current status of the building. For us, that's not enough. For us, really, a digital twin can accurately simulate the energetic lighting, acoustic, and whatever performance of the 2B renovated building as it works, right? So we want to have a digital twin, which is much more not an IFC model stored somewhere where we can look at it in 3D or something. We want to have this computer model that's actually a simulation model um, that allows us, you know, to calculate at any stage, right, how the building works, right? Because when we have such a digital twin, then we can, it really supports us in making decisions for the future in the end, right? So, for example, understanding which renovation option, right? Even more important, right, and I didn't talk about it, right? Um, there's a big, big problem. Uh, yeah, you see my mouse, I guess. Maybe a little bit, doesn't matter. But if you look at the graph, so, you know, you have a baseline period. So when you measure a building, you get something like this. And then you have peaks in there. So you see there's one peak, for example, in there. Um, might be a cold winter, right, where you heat more, right? And, um, or it might be that in this, in this year or something, you know, you had one renter in there that decided to install 10 flat screen, large screen, flat screen TVs, right? And so we also want to have the digital twin so that we can actually do scenario analysis according to, you know, all type of different weather conditions. So our calibrated digital twin that can simulate the building um, can actually allow us to, you know, just, you know, normalize it for the weather first. So we can compare different options independent of how the weather is going to be or independent of how, how the occupancy is going to be, right? But it also allows us to then put this in and uh, also try out our renovation options, for example, different weather conditions, let's say global warming, right? or different occupancy conditions. Let's say, you know, we expect that more and more people in the future will have less things, right? And so one of, I, I put it here in this, in this probabilistic term. So, you know, we want to really know the probability of the performance according to the weather. Probability of the performance according to the occupancy. So that's a, another level of complexity that we need to have in our digital twin model, right? And so then the big question at the start is, what information is really required to get to these digital twins. And then the second one is how can we calibrate and um, the simulation models that our digital twin model, simulation model in the computer really represents. Um, so you need, you know, question is we are back at the BIM, right? So what building model do you need? And this is just an example. Um, I didn't provide a reference, but uh, this is an uh, information model we created for all the stuff you need to do building performance simulation, right? We also have Revit guidelines that you can put them in and so forth, right? Um, but then this is maybe also an interesting building because you don't even, not only need to model the building, but you also need to have data for calibration. And I, I know you probably cannot read this, but you know, you need to understand which data you need, for example, from the inhabitant input. So, and that brings us back basically to what I said at the beginning, right? So we actually start mostly with monitoring. So we now suggest that before you run a renovated building, you don't have data, right? Um, spend some time. People suggest a year. I'm still discussing with them that that's not feasible and for long, but most of the time it might be feasible to really measure occupancy behavior, measure weather patterns, and also measure how your building reacts energetically and, 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 and from the lighting and so forth to all these conditions. So you build up a data baseline that you measure based on the building. Because then you can use this data baseline to really simulate the things in the computer and simulate many, many different options to calibrate that your digital twin model really matches this data baseline. Um, so how to collect data about existing buildings. And this is like the, the, you know, at the moment, this is kind of the holy grail of the digital twin. So how do we collect data 
um, about the existing condition. We're just starting a new research project, uh, um, the CBIM project, um, where we will have 14 PhD students across Europe looking at this, right? And so you need to have a lot of data to do this, but, and I hope that comes clear when I, when I explain now what we figured out, actually, we think that for this energy simulation, a lot of the data that people people at the moment work on collecting are not so important, right? And so, yeah, everybody works in laser scanning at the moment. So we do laser scanning. So here are a couple of examples from laser scan, scanning efforts we did of these old buildings, right? And at the bottom, you see a laser scan, right? And then, of course, we can do a geometric conversion of the laser scans. And this is the PhD project we had at the University of Twente, um, where we, I think we started in 2012 or something, uh, where we took point clouds of buildings and said, okay, what can we actually use these point clouds and directly transfer these point clouds into an energy simulation to really get to the simulated digital twin, right? And so we wrote the software, right? And the software kind of amazingly worked well because it turned out that we actually don't need so much, right? Because um, on the bottom right, you see actually the model that the, energy, the, the building performance software that we use, Energy Plus, and I think a lot of you who work in this uh, uses it, would spit out of one floor of this building, right? So, of course, it's a simple building and so forth, but, you know, that really started thinking already like how much detailed information do you really need to in this in this modeling phase about the geometry of the building and then um it's actually very minimal and so our thinking is so far that to create to create the digital twin to analyze actually these options we almost don't suggest any longer to do laser scan right um if we move on though, we do a lot of thermal scans, right? Um, why are thermal scans important? Because the geometry, we can model rather simplistic in these energy simulation tools. And also the accuracy is not, if, if, if the wall is like 10 centimeters smaller off or something, it doesn't matter. But what's really important is that we get realistic values for the R values, for the heat transfer coefficients, right? So that's the physical characteristic of the material, um, how, how quickly heat uh, moves through the walls, through the windows and so forth, right? And so thermal scanning helps us a lot to learn about this, right? Um, even more important, um, one of the major problems in buildings, especially in old buildings, are thermal bridges. So thermal bridges are, are small gaps in the in the building surface right where air can go out easier it's called like this or heat can go out easier um we all know what happens if there's small gaps like things go out really quickly right so basics of fluid dynamics right so oftentimes you know you can renovate the energy efficiency of a building you can improve the energy efficiency of the building just by you know fixing those thermal bridges a lot um on the other hand you need to be very careful. A lot of these um, building simulate, uh, building renovation options that you have actually might uh, include or uh, you know introduce new thermal bridges, right? So, so thermal scanning really helps us to understand where these thermal bridges come. And I think this is, for example, a much more interesting picture, right? That that really shows here this window, um, you know. And the window in the middle is the co-print here, right? And, and so thermal scanning really helps you to understand these things um, fairly quickly. Thermal scanning also helps you to identify the building system because that's the second important thing that you need to collect the data to get to this simulation digital twin. It's basically you have a good understanding about the material values, right, that are in there, the feed coefficient, but also if you have glass transparency values and so forth. Um, and the second part is really your building system, right? And so thermal scans, we, we realized also help us a lot to figure out where the building system 
in an old building go. All right, so it's a, a very powerful solution to to find where where all your heating pipes and supports go. And um, we are even working now on on robotic solutions with thermal scanners to trace these and to find defects in these as well. Um, another thing is, though, we use a lot of photos again from the inspections to identify building systems that are on the outside, right? So we really, really learn about the system. And um, then, of course, there's work in identifying building systems from point clouds again. So we go have a laser scan. Um, this is a little bit cheating because this is not a building renovation project, but this is a, a project. Um, it's actually the Qatar Foundation building um, where we work with Fuchtif, um, I think, on this project together to look whether we can automatically identify um, building system is not building system because this was a cooling plant, right? So, so different um, element of the cooling plant automatically from these laser scans, right? And so you see a couple of examples of how we could identify wells and and so forth, right? So that is also something you can do to get a better hold of the building systems, but of course only of the building systems that are outside, building systems that are behind the wall. It's very difficult to ident identify and understand. So a couple of words of more about what detail and accuracy is required in these models. So this is a study we did, um, quite old actually, um, but here we had really the chance, this is a, a building in Enschede in the Netherlands, and we really had very accurate um, performance information of this building because they measured a lot and we had the energy bills, we had like how much energy they used over 10 years and so forth. So it was really a great example to um, play around with possibilities to um, build an accurate simulated digital twin. And um, here you see, this is all the options we did. So we did very coarse geometrical models, right? And we did then um, more involved geometrical models. We even did some of um, um, with the shading where the buildings were around, some studies and so forth. And so we just played around with a lot of different options for the building model that we put into the energy simulation. At the same time, we played around with a lot of options for di modeling different types of building systems that you see on the right hand side. So we, we basically had, I think, 12 different geometrical options for the building and six different um, building system models that we applied. And then we could, of course, compare this um, with the real use of the building. And I have much more slides, but this is basically overall accuracy. So which models are accurate? And so this heat map basically shows the size of the difference between what the uh, digital twin model simulated versus how the building performed, right? And so the, the lowest, um, is somewhere here, right? And I know you can't read this, and I, I know we should have made the building, uh, the, the pictures in much higher quality back then. Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, but this is about LOD 200 um, with shading, right? So you don't really need a high LOD of the building in terms of geometry. As I said, materials you need to model really well. Um, and you know, the detailed HVAC actually didn't provide better results than some kind of estimated HVAC model, right? Or building system model. So, and of course you need to be a little bit careful with this because it's only one building and every building behaves differently and the study could look completely different, but it still gives an indication, right? That, you know, where to look for if you wanna improve the accuracy of the digital twin models in that sense, right? And so um, let me skip this slide and this one um, in the sense of time, because these are um, highly technical slides. I probably need a lot of time to, to explain these first, but I want to have the conclusions first, right? Um, so we believe, and our conclusion from these, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years of research, are really many costly methods to collect geometry often not required for establishing an accurate digital twin for buildings, right? 
Um, and of course, you know, we have our own purpose of the digital twin, right? So we don't want to have like highly realistic model or something that we can browse or whatever. We want to have a accurate possibility to simulate the energy use of the building or the building performance, not energy, but also comfort, of course, in the computer, right? Um, we also feel that it's very difficult to understand existing HVAC systems, right? But oftentimes it's not very problematic in our experience because one thing we always have to remember, old buildings often have very simple systems. And that's something we actually, on one of the, of, of the projects we proposed and we got granted to um, learn the hard way because we said, yeah, and we're going to identify the HVAC systems of these buildings of the 60s and find automated methods. And then we looked at the buildings and they hardly had any system, right? Um, and as we saw from, from the previous graph, right? So we don't know yet whether we actually have to simulate them very accurately, right? Um, very, very difficult for us is obtaining realistic ranges of occupant behavior. Um, why is that difficult? Uh, in Europe, certainly because of privacy. And I'm a big believer in privacy. Uh, so if I would rent an apartment, I don't want people to measure me. No way, right? You can, you can uh, promise me all energy savings or digital twins or whatever. Please don't measure me, right? And so it's very difficult, right? Even if we want to do scans or inspections in apartments, it's very difficult for us to get in the apartment. Then it might be interesting to have a discussion about how that is in different countries and different cultures, right? But people tend to not let us in their apartments. People tend to not explain, uh, want to talk to us about these things and so forth. So um, we are really, um, trying to work on. So we, we, we work on like gamification solutions, for example, um, where we can ask people to, um, to, to like tell us what they do across the day and they get points for it, but it is very difficult, right? And, and, and ethical, also very important to think about the ramifications and what people could actually do with the data other than, you know, providing um, highly accurate performance simulation. Right. And then um, calibration is the most important challenging part. And that's when I jump back to the other two slides that I just skipped over, um, because this is really about the calibration. I want to talk much about it because it's almost a, a science in itself. Could have got, given a whole keynote um, just about calibration. But basically what you need to look into is really um, looking at the sensitivity analysis of, you know, how you change different input parameters in your model and how that changes the output. If you have measurement data of your, how your building performs, you can then see, right, how your digital twin model um, measures this and then change and calibrate your model accordingly. Right? For example, by experimenting with a long range of different R values, right? And of course you can automate it, just takes a lot of time and you know the simulations take a lot of time, but you can play through a lot of ranges for the for the for the different material behaviors of the building and so forth to really calibrate your model, right? But once you have a model calibrated, then you also need to understand the sensitivity, right? As I said at the beginning, it's very important um, that we have models where we know what the effect of different weather conditions will be. Right, so we can, you know, do scenario analysis. Like, remember that we want to have the probability that the building performance like this, given a certain right um, occupancy behavior or weather condition. And so, for that, you need to apply sensitivity analysis methods, which is again, you know, um, an, an on keynote lecture. If you're interested, look it up. Um, um, it's great, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, we play around with this, but um, out of scope for here, right. But this is a little bit of an introduction of how we can calibrate the models that they really, really um, um, represent the building. Another thing that I, I skipped over is really the surroundings of the building. So um, this is just an ontology that we developed just recently about all 
the knowledge that you you could collect about the surroundings of the buildings that might also affect the renovation and you know things. So that's also some data you can collect. And whether it's only one thing, you might understand what the vegetation is about. Are there shading trees around? Is there a park? Park creates different microclimates in the area, right? You want to understand what the traffic is um, uh, and, and so forth, right? What the water delivery is. And that's really some work in progress we have. Um, when you have a hopefully highly accurate digital twin, the next problem comes with choosing the right options, right? Um, so this is just a collage, let me call it a collage of different um, things that you can do during building uh, renovations, right? So you can put in your window elements. This is a Dutch solution where they put a whole new facade on top of the building, right? It's really funny because they can do that in a day and they take the old facade off. And we have pictures where you look into the bedrooms and it's all open and then they plug the new facade on, right? Um, uh, here's another window solution. Here's like some kind of facade element, um, HVAC elements on the roof to improve your building systems. Here's another panel solution, um, uh, a bathroom solution, a prefab bathroom solution and so forth, right? So what all, all of these have in common, and that's, that's something we really realized um, is also different in building renovation than in, 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 um, in, in new construction it becomes a lot more production. So most of the architects um, that, that look at the building renovation are really buying products from different suppliers and plug them in, right? But then how do you understand which product, product that you buy on the market, window, HVAC component, whatever it is, right? It gives you a big impact, right? And then it gets even more complex because, you know, you can combine them. So which combination of them gives you a good impact, right? And does it make sense if I if I change the facade and add this window? Does it have an impact? Does it not have an impact? Does it revert the impact? So it's highly complex. But the good thing is if you have the accurate digital twin, right? You can change the values in the digital twin and simulate it. Right? So what you really need is like these ways to choose different combinations of options, right? And this is just an example, right? Where um, very simple three options. Of course, there are many more that you can choose just to illustrate this a little bit and then as i already said it's a multi-criteria decision-making problem right where we you don't not only want to understand right um the energy behavior right um the co2 but also cost things and and comfortable that uh, people are comfortable right? and you can see this is a very simple example there's only like glazing window and external facade and the combination of it but you can imagine there are like zillions of these products. I mean, there's even like, probably if you look on the European market, thousand different window options. Right? And they are constantly changing, right? And so what we are thinking of, and, and, and we started developing them as well, that is what we call these product configurators, right? So we have, we call it here still the asset BIM, we would say nowadays, right? It's a little bit of old figure, the digital twin, right? Um, we can calculate it and then we can play around or even the computer can play around and our partner um, MetaBuild in Berlin, it's a Berlin startup, they actually have a huge database of different um, building products and can actually optimize it already with some uh, optimization algorithms, right? And then they give you the multi-criteria evaluation of different options and um, ideally this can be not a nice figure, but this can be integrated in the e-marketplace, right? So that, that, that then comes to the business side, right? And, 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 and closes actually for us, that closes commercially, that would close this whole cycle of models, right? First of all, you need to have good, accurate digital twin that can simulate, right? Then you need to understand different products and you need to model the product. It's also a, a building information modeling challenge, right? So how do you uh, model different products that you can, you know, switch things in your digital twin very quickly and also have the computer automatically do that for you right and then you can integrate it on the market and you know providers of windows all type of renovation elements can provide the products on the market and users can see okay 
um, you know, we, we get a consultant, a local consultant who can create a digital twin of my model. I upload it to the marketplace and I can, you know, get my best options or the marketplace already has some kind of optimization function that suggests really good options, right? Preferable from local suppliers because we don't want to ship stuff um, across all Europe because that's also very CO2 expensive. So much for modeling. And um, I promised I talk a little bit about making. And mainly I talk a little bit about making because I think it gives some kind of um, intriguing thinking about this level of detail thing. Right? So what we already learned like from the modeling thing is that actually to get this digital twin, the simulated digital twin, and when we look at the existing BIM level of detail standard, we can work off a fairly low level of detail. Right? So we don't need to have a lot of detail to do this digital twins. We know, need to know a lot about the materials, right? And occupancy behavior. I need measure data to calibrate and things like that. But the BIM the level of detail doesn't need to be so high, right? If you go on the construction side into the making, that switches around completely, right? And I don't know, whoever has renovated, you know, sometimes you work at your home, right? And if you have an old home, um, you know how tilted things are and how difficult it is and how difficult it is to make things fit, right? Because after 20, 30, 40 years, walls are no longer straight. Um, window openings are no longer square. Um, ceilings are hanging. Um, and this can actually at the moment not even be modeled accurately in the, in the BIM solution here, right? And so we need to kind of understand what is required for that. And um, so we started working on um, an ontology there. So this is rather recent work about what ontology is for us in knowledge mapping, right? So we don't think about standards and exchange and something. We just want to know what do people who install things on site need to know, right? And so that's our first start. And what the most important thing is, is really this building interface. So if you want to bring in a new renovation product into an existing building, you need to understand where this renovation product interfaces with the existing building. And at that interface, you need to have highly accurate information, right? To really um speed up the installation to make sure that you can install install it right to maybe allow some custom tailored prefab and the and the thing right so you know we're moving to a additive manufacturing world right so so one of the hopefully next projects we're going to do is about any additive manufacturing of these elements right but you need to know the interfaces and the geometry and i think there is where when i said you know don't do a laser scan to just create a digital twin for, for modeling where the lasers can really will provide value in the future. But we need to come to, to a different way of modeling this in 3D, in the BIM model, right? And we need to start thinking much more, you know, we need new ontologies that, that can model the interface, right? Um, and as I said, this is kind of like early work of us, and, and, but this is, um, I think, very interesting um, work and very important work for the future. Um, and as I said, it, it's will be leading probably to quite different representations, digital representations of our, our geometrical models and, and our BIM and the computer. Um, so here are a couple of examples of how we try to model things and with which accuracy actually model things off, off of the laser scan um, in the building information model. Um, we know in practice when they renovate um, like old buildings, we um, we looked at, for example, the what was it, the Opera in Stockholm, the renovation of the Opera in Stockholm. So there they, for example, had a BIM model of the existing, but of course it was highly inaccurate because you couldn't model all these tilted elements and so forth and Revit. And so they used Revit, right? And so they, they then labeled the elements, right? And they, they had like kind of an indication of how much this element was off from the recondition based on the laser scan and so forth. And that was already um, a little bit helpful, right? And then, you know, they started playing around with clash detection, but they figured out that 
this doesn't work because the geometrical descriptions that we get with our representations are not good enough yet and so forth. But this is, yeah, I guess a, a big area for future research and, and, and very interesting. So I'm thrilled to see what comes out and and hope maybe some, some of you guys want to pick it up as well. And um, with that, I, I guess I want to close my little discussion, um, but there's a lot of work to do, right? So I think we are just scratching the surface of, you know, like that's why I called it digitizing, slowly moving to digitalization, digitalizing the, the process, right? Doing things that we significantly could do different. But a lot of the stuff I of course showed was we do that, but we can improve it for probably a digital solution. And yeah, I don't know who, who's still there, but but um thank thank you so much for, for, for listening to me, also in this awkward format. I wish we could all uh, go to, to the Samba now, but uh, um, next time in Sao Paulo, right, Sergio? Yes, of course. So uh, maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Timo, for this uh, so exciting and challenging uh, presentation about your method for M. Um, I have some questions. Uh, I, as a chair, I can make one first question, maybe. Actually, a comment because you talk about materials and the need for a more detailed modeling for materials mm. because of the simulation and analysis. We need more de more uh, calibration of the professionals, the guys that will interpret all this data. Uh, any comment about this? Uh, how to prepare the new engineers and architects to use the real engineering analysis yeah i mean <laughs> the question that that was the other keynote i i, I suggested <laughs> right um, what do the engineers in the future need to learn right um yeah so i i like that question because this is something we think a lot and i was like in the luxurious con uh, situation that we I, I could start a new department from scratch and so we could change all the teaching program and I don't know if we did do a good job, but I can just say what we did. Um, so we said the engineers of the future need to know four things. Um, one thing is they really need to know um, product and parametric modeling. And mm -hmm. in our opinion, not BIM. We extra don't call it BIM because they mm -hmm. need to understand, they need to be able to um, uh, formalize knowledge. They need to understand what people need to know to design and engineer buildings or infrastructure better and model that in the computer and best model that parametrically in the computer, right? Um, we also know, think that they need to have a much deeper introduction in multi-physics simulation. Mm -hmm. I see wonderful question from Mathieu here rolling in, right? About, you know, mm -hmm. hidden defects, more structural weakness, right? And so forth. So um, I, I believe the engineers of the future will really need to be able to deal with multi-physics simulations and bringing them into one model, right? Which I think requires a significant mind shift also how we teach in the end, right? Um, the third thing is they need to understand data, right? So a lot of the things on, on model calibration, measurements and so forth has to do with advanced data analytics, right? But also a lot of the things with like automatic, like extraction of information from poly clouds and geometry and so forth um, also relies on, on, on data analytics methods, right? And the fourth thing is, and, and the, probably the most important thing, all these three things need to lead to what we call integrated color wave engineering. So we need to teach our students how they can work. Everybody needs to be strong in their own discipline but they also need to all know how to work together better. Good. Right. So that's what we try to do. Let's see if it works. And I see my wife's working in the background. Sorry for that. <laughs> this is fun. Thank you for this uh, first answer. We have some answers here. The first one you can read is from our chair, Professor Toledo Santos. Um, which one, like, can I read them? Uh, okay. Does this project aim also to publish a practical guide for professionals? Ah, okay. Yeah. You, you, you find? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I scrolled up. Um, that's, that's it. Um, 
Yeah, it's always difficult, right? So I'm, I'm like, I'm always saying part of what I want to do is what the practitioners in five to 10 years need, right? As the university, but um, we, we do work with a lot of startups and we see that um, Berlin is a great place to be because we have a really big startup culture and a lot of them are driven actually by the construction and, and, and building industry, right? And so as you saw, I showed a couple of buildings by partners, right? And so we, I think there are business models already around these things, right, that we work on. And especially building renovation is, is really big business, right? So you can actually, I, that, I tell that to my students too, right? So, you know, you don't need to do continuous stuff like, you know, you do and when start working in a structural engineering office or something, right? You can start a new company. Say we renovate buildings significantly different than, you know, you did. And you use, you know, you start using some of these techniques, but over time you get better and better. And it's a, it's a humongous business. So I I'm, I'm know that, you know, we, uh, we have a lot of old companies who don't want to change. But I see a lot of change with like new young uh, entrepreneurs moving into that market, right? Some of them even coming from the software side, but then switching really to engineering consultancy because they realize, okay, we wanted to actually um, develop a, a website that can do building optimization based on energy simulations, right? And then they realize they get much better in energy simulations and understanding building performance than, you know, the traditional, you know, uh, consultants that are there, right? And then they do only consultancy any longer and they say, you know, we don't need the web platform, right? And so a lot of these things happen now. So I, I believe there's a change. Good. We have a second second question you can follow in the Yeah, so that screen. would be, okay. how is time series data from building monitoring linked to the building information model in order to create the digital trend? Yeah. That's an interesting question, right? I mean, um, I believe it's just a matter of software implementation, to be honest. So what we have, we have like, we, we have IoT databases and we, we work with um, also one of our, our partners that we work quite is the, the Serbian company Mainflux. They have an open source IoT solution. And it's quite easy to, to link that to um, BIM objects, right? To an ID and so forth, right? But the, the key is really not I think we need to make this mind shift because what we need to do is the time we need to link the time series data and aggregate it and mine it and be able to link it smartly um, to the simulation results. Yeah. I think that's the key to the digital trend, right? Yeah. So I mean, we know we know of startups, right? So that's happening everywhere, right? So so we know a lot of startups that that do that. They create a digital twin platform now, right? And that can actually you know, you click an object and you see the stream coming in, right? But the key is, what do you do with the stream then? Right, so I, I, I'd like to think already for what's the next step on this question. Okay. Right. Thank you. Um, Let's uh, see, Jacob's, Jacob's question. Wow, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> That's something yeah. for the politicians. Um, we just write proposals, right? But... Um, yeah, I mean, I'm coordinating the BIM speed and we, we collaborate a lot. And it's quite interesting to see because um, we we do all fly in from different um, angles into this, right? And so we we actually do all kind of different things. What you have thought, you know, that like we have five BIM projects about renovation at the moment, right? All together for 30 million or something. Everybody gets a part of the sport and everybody does something different and you know that because you're on one as well right and i think that is the important part i think you know science and research lists that different people have you know their ideas and, and explore their ideas but do that scientifically right and then and then we learn from each other what's a better option what what, what can lead to what and so forth right and um i know i still owe um that, that workshop that I wanted to organize in Berlin across these projects um, where we bring the scientists together. Um, because I think that's that's our thing. We, we are, the scientists need to compare. Right? We need to collect data. We need to experiment. We need to set up hypotheses, right? All type of different options that are possible to improve things, right? But then we need to come together and compare, right? 
and it's often difficult for the politicians to understand, right? They always want to push us in one direction. I want to have clear research guide ma maps and so forth, but I think that is not a good approach, right? I think we need to experiment. And you can see the second part, then we have a third yeah. one. So <laughs> data sets for collaboration, open toolkits. Yeah, toolkits are good, right? Um, data set, yeah, data sets. We need to common data sets are good. Um, standards, uh, it's not, I, I don't see myself as a, as a researcher and scientist and educator um, doing standards. That's something that industry needs to figure out. I think we are doing it a little bit wrong. If you look at other industries, other industries innovate and, and, and create the products first. And then shortly, then they sit together and say, okay, now we need to create a standard after everybody has their own solutions, right? Kind of. Um, yeah, um, I like the, the open toolkits I find a little bit difficult because, you know, um, will we always be behind? And we use a lot of stuff from computer science, but technical frameworks I, I like, and for especially I'd say research methods. We are very, very weak in having common research methods that allow us to compare things, right? And yeah, that's my opinion, but you know, we can discuss this more. Um, okay. Then I have James, thanks for power doing me. Yes. You recommend a specific yeah. mechanism to determine data requirement specification, pre-modeling phase when we're renovating according to the standard. Yeah, again, you know, I'm a little bit struck by the standard. I think at a certain point in time, we need a standard, but only when we know what we really need. And I don't have the feeling yet, and I don't know if that came out throughout the presentation, that I really have a good understanding of what, for example, standard is then always, you know, when we talk about it, usually a BIM standard, right? What we really need to see, what, how we, what information do we need that is really supporting the field. And only when we have that, then I would go for a standard, right? And in, in this renovation world, I don't see it quite yet, right? So we need to experiment much more. We need to have many more competing models. And then when we have a lot of them, and we, we know like this worked well, this ontology worked kind of well to build this database, this ontology worked well to support this digital twin and so forth, right? Then we can come together and compare and, and, and maybe find a standard, but the standard will always be, you know, in, in the definition lower, of course, utility than, you know, some of the good models. It needs to align, right? Um, okay. so I just go yeah. further, right? Um, not many software offer the possibility to send data updated through uh, CAFM back into a BIM model. Updating BIM models by non-BIM major stakeholders seem to be a big obstacle. This yeah. is our first one. From no. Oh, what are the legal concerns to start a new renovation project? Um, no, I guess the answer is kind of the same, right? So I, I think we are a little bit too early. I think we are still in the innovation phase. Um, and I think also because I'm coming also more from the entrepreneurial side, I, I think this is a, is, a, is a moving target and it will be a really a moving market, right? So many companies will come up with, you know, better digital trends to support this. And they might keep this proprietary, which I think is completely fine, right? then another company needs to come up with a better one, right? And so this this gives room for maybe also like, you know, innovative startups, um, new al alliances um, that decide to, to renovate whole local districts, right? Just new business models. Maybe, maybe not everything needs to be done by big contractors and so forth, right? Um, maybe people can organize them on the, on the local level. Right, where you have many diff many the same buildings and so forth, right? Um, yeah, user data habits is already harvested in various ways. Electricity counters, customer counters, and stores. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I I do agree. Um, so, I would not like to. I mean, I know it's security cameras and buildings, but I would. Um, not like to see that data used, right? 
to understand when and where I, I'm at home and using the thing because I, I mean, I'm just like, I, I think we need to think much more about privacy at the moment, right? Because um, um, these things can be also very highly misused. And then there's always the argument in the end, right? Oh yeah, but you know, we collect this for your own good and for the good of the economy, but you know, and we, we will never use it to control you, right? But if you want to sign the next rental contract and uh, your, your uh, landlord knows that you um, coming home um, uh, 5 a.m. every Friday, Saturday and Sunday, um, um, like walking like from left to right, right? Um, you might not get the contract. And nobody will know, right? So I think it's, uh, we need to find, I mean, we start this, um, we now have um, privacy experts on our projects. Um, and we really start looking into these privacy things and how we can maybe disaggregate data from like um, combined things to get the information that we need, right? Um, anonymized data, right? But um, a lot of these, that you say would be also not very possible for a lot of um, German um, apartment complexes, I'd say. Okay. Bro, so thank you, Timo. There is some other question here, but uh, about uh, Mathieu, I guess you, about uncert levels of uncertainty. Uncertainty. Where, where do you see that? Is it on, on the screen, maybe? Oh, the modeling. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Modeling of existing buildings is affected by various levels of uncertainty, hidden effects, most structural weakness. Yeah, so it's a difficult question, but um, we don't at the moment. <laughs> let's say it like this. Um, so what we do, what, what we what we do work on is this calibration and the sensitivity analysis with respect to different weather conditions and so forth. And then um, we basically adjust the, the physical values in the calculation models, right? Um, and then we hope with that we can somehow average these things out, right? But it's a very, very difficult problem on, on, on these. Like structural, structural weakness is a killer for a lot of renovation projects. We, we had that on, on some of ours, right? Where people wanted to do really cool things and then, you know, the basement couldn't carry the load. Um, yeah, mold is a big problem, but, you know, we can, we can, we, can, we start to be able to detect this, of course, um, uh, also with thermal scans, um, hidden defects also. So we actually having a research project where we work on that, so look, looking at thermal scans and looking how we can automatically detect hidden defects modes. Um, but it's not yet in our models. Good. And I, I guess this is the models. last question. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you for the participants for the question. It's a very nice discussion and uh, exciting uh, presentation because there is a number of things to do. <laughs> number yeah. of things to do. <laughs> You have to prepare well the new engineers and architects to deal with this uh, this way of doing this renovation yeah. project. Thank okay. you very much, Timo. Oh, See you around in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me and um, thanks for everybody joining in. I don't even yes. know how Maybe many next of... year in Brazil. Okay. Yeah, I hope, <laughs> I hope I can come again. Okay, thank you very bye -bye. much. Thank, thank you very you much, all. everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Uh, good evening. Greetings.